Welcome to today's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I am proud to introduce Coach Seth Berger of Westtown School in Westchester, Pennsylvania. He's in his 12th season at the school, and he's won two state titles since taking over. And since that time, he has coached players that have played at every level of college, to include some that have played in the NBA, which include Mo Bamba and Cam Reddish. Uh, Seth went to Penn and got his MBA from the Wharton School. He's worked on many startups to include founding the sneaker and apparel company And One. Yes, we have an apparel company. Uh, And One was number two in the U.S. for sneaker sales back in 2001. So he's got some great stories on that. Seth also worked in Congress. And currently when he's not coaching, he's working as a venture capitalist. On this episode, we talk about a lot of things. One, to include how he turned Westtown into a national power Uh, what it was like to start and one, some cool experiences he had doing that, Um, talking about transfers and some experiences he had with why Mo Bamba and Cam Reddish and Derek Lively are going to be longtime NBA players. So great episode coming up. I really enjoyed it. If you like this episode, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube or any of the major podcasting platforms. Tell a friend, like it, comment, all the stuff to get you guys engaged. So without further ado, Let's please welcome Coach Seth Berger, head coach of Westtown School. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. So, Seth, thanks for joining me today. Um, I want to start out and say that you have had several successful uh, ventures in the business world. And um, with that being said, I know you were in that world for a while. You're in it now. Why did you want to coach prep school basketball? Great question. I I think probably in high school, when I was playing high school basketball, that I knew I wanted to be a basketball coach at some point in my life. Uh, I would say that high school basketball is probably the most important experience for me growing up and um, I can speak to literally a specific conversation that I had with my high school coach who was our athletic director who used to mop the floor I don't know if he mopped it every day um, but made his life being an athletic director and the boys basketball coach and eventually the girls basketball coach at a prep school in New York had a massive impact on my life Um, and so I love basketball and I felt like at some point, it would be the best way for me to have the biggest impact. Uh, the two things that I want to do with my life are number one, have fun, and number two, make a difference. So I love basketball. Uh, I love coaching high school kids. And um, I felt like back then, I was like, oh, I want to spend my life in a gymnasium. Like that's 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 my, you know, one of my favorite places to be. Uh, and being a high school coach would be the way to do it. Uh, I did not, however, envision myself always want to struggle financially as many high school coaches do so i didn't think i was going to go into it right away the two things i'd say is had i gone to play division three basketball instead of thinking i was good enough to play division one basketball and i wasn't i probably would have pursued a path of getting into college coaching right away out of college i probably would have been a four-year d3 kid and then tried to be a GA and an assistant and a head college coach. Um, I'm glad I didn't because I think I would not have been able to handle the pressure of being a college coach and a young coach. And I think I was lucky to get into high school coaching later. But but that story was, um, I was uh, not the best player on our team. I was starting point guard junior and senior year. Started at the two junior years, started point guard senior year. We had two really good scorers and two other really good starters. Um, and our team was, I don't know, I think two and one or three and one to start the season. And, but we were struggling. And before practice one day, my high school coach put the team together and he said, you know, this team is struggling because no one here is being the leader. We need someone to be thinking about what everyone else needs on this team to be talking to, the, to your teammates about what everyone else should be doing. You know, I'm the coach, but I need a leader on the court and I need a leader in practice. And our two best players, as, as you oftentimes, were the two captains. So we had practice, and the next day I was thinking about what he said, and um, 
for better or for worse, I've never really cared what people think of me. I always feel like part of what my job is to say what people need to hear, not what they want to hear. And so I went to my coach the next day for practice. I was, I was the first one in the gym. I said, hey, coach, you know, I know I'm not a captain, but like, I, I think like, I think I can do that for this team. And uh, he was actually putting a net up one of the side hoops as we were having a conversation on the ladder. And he said, uh, Berger, I was talking to you. You're the point guard. I kept you on JV as sophomore so you can learn to be a point guard. You know what every, everyone should be doing out there. It's time for you to step up and be a leader. And I was like, got it. And, and, and in every role I've been in, I felt like um, leadership is service. And so I get into a new situation. I'm like, how can I best serve the group? Until that moment in my life, I don't think I ever thought of myself as someone who could potentially be a leader. And, uh, and so, you know, for me, I was like, oh, wow. Like this guy impacted my life forever with, you know, being my high school basketball coach. I would love to be able to do that for kids in my own life. Gotcha. And you said you went to a prep school. Which prep school did you go to? Yeah, I went to Horace Mann. No um, kidding. Okay. Yeah, so I went to, I went to public through fifth. And then uh, I took the ERBs and, um, and I remember when my parents showed me the bill for Harris, man, back then it was 3,500 bucks. I don't know if we were on financial aid. I'm not sure what the total was. And uh, they showed me the bill. And I, was, we were, I was, couldn't have a second soda at dinner anymore. Um, and uh, then I was there for a year and my mom wanted me to test for Hunter, Bronx Science and Stuyvesant for the magnet schools. I took the, I got, I was like, mom, I'm not smart enough to do that. Like, I, I you know, my, my first test at Harsh Man, I got 36 and I thought I aced it in sixth grade. So um, I took the test for Hunter after the first, second question, I knew I had no shot. So I was like, sorry, mom and dad, like uh, I'm going to Harsh Man. And then I almost transferred actually to collegiate um, my sophomore year. Um, he, Coach Byrne offered me an opportunity to move over and probably play a bigger role a little bit earlier, but I decided to stay at HM. It was great, I loved Harsh Man. You know, uh, it was perfect for me in terms of intensity and the academics really prepared me for college and uh, in so many ways. Gotcha. Now, you're at West Town. When you got there, they did not have the best record in previous years. And you have since, during your tenure, turned it into a national powerhouse. Uh, on the previous prep school episode or podcast, we had uh, my high school coach on, Danny Haney from Lexington Catholic, and he turned that from you know, a, a pretty good team in Lexington, Kentucky to a national powerhouse as well. We talked about that process. And I'm kind of curious um, because there's a lot of coaches out there that would love to know the formula on how to turn their team into a national powerhouse. So can you walk me through basically, you know, the steps you took to get to the level you're at today? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great question. I think the, the first thing I would say is that that was never my goal was to be, you know, to be a, a program that's reached the level that we have. My goal was first and foremost, only to help kids reach your highest level. Now, I go back to my high school experience. We had, you know, five kids who I think, one for sure could have played division one ball and maybe two um, and none did. And I felt like um, we were, we, we didn't do the right things out of season. I mean, from a talent perspective, we didn't do the right things out of season to reach our highest level as athletes. Um, and so when I started coaching at West Town, my goal was simply to help high school basketball players reach their highest level. And whether that means they were gonna be really good D3 kids, D1 kids didn't matter, but I wanted a kid to come to West Town as a basketball player. And when they got done in our program, to have gotten the most they could out of our out of themselves as basketball players. Um, and so when I interviewed for the job, so I was an assistant for two years. Interesting story. I was an assistant for two years. Um, my second year, we first year we were decent. We were 11 and nine. We had one kid, two kids who played D2 ball, one kid who went to walk on at a, at a Patriot school. And then my second year as an assistant, we were bad. We were three and 15. And we, we were like most high school programs. You know, the ball was rolled out in November and put away at the end of February. As a boarding school, was, as you know, we took 12 days off for Thanksgiving and 20 days off for Christmas. And so we had 
half the in-season practice days as the schools against which we competed. So um, at the end of the second year, I had realized that at that point I wanted to make a difference through coaching. And so I told my head coach, hey, I said, thanks so much for this opportunity. I have learned a ton, um, but at the end of the, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go on and try to be an assistant or a head coach at, at a local public school in the city um, or in Coatesville or somewhere to make a difference around here uh, in a program that values achievement, a- athletic achievement more than our, our community does. At the time, Westtown was in the process of really understanding how impactful sports could be to a kid's development and growth and hadn't gotten to the side of, hey, sports are really meaningful. It, it, sports are really secondary at Westtown, not just basketball. Like wrestling was a great program and I kind of modeled our program off him, uh, what he's done. And there were some sports that had been good on and off, but as a whole, West Ham wasn't an athletic community. Today, over a third of our students are recruited athletes and the schools really turned into a budding athletic powerhouse. Um, So long story short, at the end of my second year, after I had stepped down, my head coach actually stepped down. His youngest son was getting ready to be a freshman in a different high school and he wanted to spend more time with him. I used to teach her that headmaster and AD, uh, head of school and AD asked me if I wanted to interview for the head coaching role. And I told them I would be happy to, but there were three things that I needed to ask for um, in order to make this program real. First was I wanted to be able to train the kids eight months a year. When, When school starts the Tuesday after Labor Day, we have our first workout. I have four or five assistants every year, and we basically focus an incredible amount of time on skill development. I think that that ultimately is the big differentiator as kids want to move up, you know? It's literally fundamentals of basketball mixed with trying to teach the highest level of reads on off ball screens, ball screens, you name it. Um, The second thing, and so I need, I wanted time. And I said, I don't want any, any money for coming in September and October and March, April, and May, but we want to be half of a college program in terms of the amount of time that we dedicate these kids to these kids and we ask these kids to dedicate to themselves. Um, the second thing was in season and Thanksgiving break and no, and Christmas break, I wanted us to play tournaments mm. so that we could continue to have practices, right? So we would always send our kids home and then start up again. And, and the kids would just be too far behind to catch up. Uh, and then the third thing I said is I had no doubt that I could find academically qualified basketball players uh, to come to West Ham. And, and, I, and I wanted the school to dedicate a certain amount of financial aid to kids if they qualified for need-based aid um, who could play basketball, who, who could do the work. Uh, and I think there's always been a myth around basketball and football that, that basketball and football players can't be good students. It's just not true. Uh, and I had been a parent in the West Town community. My oldest son is now 22. All my three sons have been at West Town since pre-kindergarten. So I said, listen, I would never ever um, uh, compromise the values of our community in any way, in any kids that I bring in. And it starts with academics and character. So if you trust me that I'm not gonna watch a film of a kid until I've seen a transcript, um, those are the three things that I need. And uh, the, the school said yes. And so then I think what's happened since literally then is I worked really hard to identify kids for whom West Town is a fit. Um, I do spend a fair amount of time watching kids, getting to know them, getting to know their families. It's not just as simple as, hey, that kid can hoop, he should be here. I've told kids who, one, I think will be in the league that this was not the right place because from a community perspective, he didn't want to engage as much as we want our kids to engage. You know, we've had four of our last seven kids at West Ham, our student body presidents have been basketball players. Mm-hmm. Um, so one is identifying right kids. One thing that I think I do in my life very well is I think I identify talented people in general, whether it's in the business world, I think, you know, M1 was successful because we enab- we gave the opportunity to so many young people to be their best. As a venture capitalist, I think I do a good job of identifying talented people and basketball players and coaches as well. 
Uh, and I think part of that is because my ego is not wrapped up in it. So I'm not looking at a player and I don't necessarily, I, I look at who that player can be as opposed to, I think so many of us coaches, we weren't as good players as, as we wish we had been, right? And so we immediately try to put players into a box of what they can't do. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do with players is who can they be at their highest level? If, if we give them the, the, the freedom to try new things and teach them the right way to do really high level basketball moves and plays, who can they be at their highest level? And I think it requires for me, you know, taking my ego out of it. You know, I, I always joked that I was never good enough to play Aggie ball. I didn't realize it until I was 47. And then, and then I realized it. And then I played well that day. And I realized again, that all the coaches were wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so, I, so, so in terms of first, it starts with having an administration that is totally supportive of your program. If your administration, your, your head of school, your athletic director and the boys basketball coach are not aligned, you have no shot. With their support, you can really impact kids in the community. The second thing is, before you even go get kids, you have to figure out what your program is about. Our program is about skill development, we, having their kids reach their highest level. We will lose games because we put kids in positions that they might not have been in before, where they might fail and they will learn through that failure and be better the next time. And I'm totally comfortable losing those games. Mm, my job great. as a, yeah, my job as the West Ham basketball coach is to help kids reach their highest level, not to win 32 games a year. Um, and then the third thing is I have to get coaches around me that are better than me, not necessarily in everything, but in specific things. And so when I start, like I, I, I play mostly pick and roll as a kid. So I'm very comfortable teaching pick and roll and continue to learn how to teach pick and roll. The first time I ever moved without the basketball, I think I was probably 43 years old. <laughs> so I have a coach on my staff who's really good at teaching off ball movement, right? Um, as a defensive coach, I, you know, like I played really hard. I was a really good defender. I didn't understand why you have to teach certain things on the defensive end. So I have a really good defensive technique coach. So that's other things. I have really good coaches. And then, um, and then the last thing I would say is finding kids who want to be the best player they can be and yet are always willing to put the team first is very hard. Those things on, the fa on their face appear to be mutually exclusive. I want to be the best player I can be, but the team's success matters more, right? And for me, if I ever sense a kid um, is about himself more than he is about the team, I don't take them. I have no interest in fighting that battle. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to fight that battle with, with the parents, you know, every day. So all those things together, I think have, we've been very lucky. Danny Lochefu came very early in my career and he ended up at, at his height being the number 12 ranked player in the country. And we historically, I think the, the impression is that we've had a lot of high major kids roll in. The reality is Cam Reddish came into West Ham as a seventh ranked player in the class and he left at number three. The next highest ranked player to ever come to West Ham was Mo Bamba who came at 54, left at number four. Um, Brandon Randolph was unranked, left at number 17. Jalen Worley was unranked, I think left as a top 30. Derek Lively was unranked, who is currently number one player in the class. Um, so what we really try to do is identify kids who can be great, who can be D1 kids, who can be pros, and then help them be their best. The last thing I'd say is, if there's a kid who's, who's a lock to be great, don't come to West Ham. If you know, like, if you know you're going to the league, it's a done deal. The reality is you should probably go to a place that doesn't place the same emphasis on academics that we do, because academics always come first at West Ham. If you're not doing your work, you won't be on the court, right? Um, and some kids, if you know you're a pro, you don't need to spend that much time in the classroom. It's just the reality of the situation. So being very long-winded, administration, administrative support, um, 
having the humility to look at how great a player can be without your own lens in the rear view mirror, identifying really good assistant coaches who are totally committed to the kids, uh, and then having kids that buy into what your program is all about. I would say those are probably the four things that, that um, have been really crucial to our success. Yeah, that's all great stuff. Thanks for sharing that, Seth. And speaking of players like Mo and Cam, like the stat I heard recently that blew my mind is only 5,000 players have played in the NBA since its inception. Never knew that stat before, and that blew me away. And the reason it's so important to you and I is that, you know, about 75% of the kids that reach out to me say, hey, I want to go to prep school and get a college scholarship and play in the NBA. Or some kids just don't even talk about college. They say, I want to play in the NBA. Uh, and with those numbers being so low, it, it's a it's a you know a moonshot to make that happen. But you actually had two pros with Cam Reddish, uh, Mo Bamba, Derek Lively has a good chance of being a pro as well. What did those guys possess that you can share to people out there listening that they maybe could incorporate into their life, or is it something they're just born with and have inside that they even can't explain? Right. I, I think. Um... There's, there's another interesting stat, right? 17% um, of seven footers make the NBA. So you think that's it. a really high number, right? Let's just, let's, let's, let's do coach math and say that's one out of five, right? But that means four out of five don't, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to your, to your point, well, what's the fact, what's the one thing, what's the thing that that one out of five, seven footers have that the four out of five don't? All right, so Cam Reddish, um, Mo Bamba, Daniel Chase, who played in the league for a bit. I have a kid named George Papianos who played in the league for a bit um, and uh, also was 13th pick. Um, I think Randolph probably would have had a contract last summer had he not got hurt. The, what I think people don't understand is, first of all, there is truly a level of athletic greatness that, that some of these kids have. Correct. They're brain and their body both operate at a speed that most normal people don't. Mm -hmm. So we just like the difference at every level as you move up is not necessarily size and strength, it's actually speed. So that means your body and your brain have to operate really, really quickly. Second is there's a lot of time that these kids put into the gym. Cam Reddish is the most skilled basketball player I will ever coach. He lived in the gym. There's literally no move that Cam Reddish could not do. You could invent a move, show it to him. He'd look at it, do, 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 whatever his brain would compute and do it. Now, as an aside, Cam Reddish might have thrown one of the best football passes I've ever seen. We were down in the gym in Florida. There were two courts. We were having a practice before a City Palms event. My assistant, who probably still ran a 4 4 40 back in the day, said, Hey, Cam, you play quarterback in middle school. He's like, Yep, throw me a pass. No warm up, throws a pass. Uh, you know, I played football in college here. That, you know, perfect tight spiral on the hands. I was like, Oh my God, it's one of the best athletes, I think, in anything you've ever seen. So the NBA is the highest level athlete in the world, in my opinion, of any sport. And most of them, have had to work incredibly hard. Mo is very gifted in that he's also one of the smartest kids I've ever met. So Mo could have gone to Harvard without basketball. It just rocks our brain. So again, his brain operates. He's got a perfect basketball body along with a brain that is incredibly perfect. The one thing I'd also say is that what's what's crazy, I think, and, and it's not really unfortunate for kids in the social media culture today, is so many basketball players today, if all they ever do is play Division One basketball for free and don't play a minute professionally, it is now somehow viewed as failure. When you think about it, like, and I, you know, you and I know a bunch of guys who play D1 ball. They're in their 50s. Playing D1 ball was still probably the best experience of their life. They loved it. They loved their teammates. They loved being in the gym. They loved the practices. I mean, let's celebrate that achievement as opposed to, oh man, yeah, he was really good, but he he didn't make the league. Like he played D1 ball, went to college for free, had an unbelievable experience. That's amazing. 
right? Let's look at really good D3 players. Man, like one of the life experiences I wish I had, like my life has worked out, but I wish I had gone, I almost transferred to Wesley in my, adding my sophomore year, because I, I really miss playing college basketball. Like division three basketball players are really, really, really good. So what I think those guys have is the guys who make the league is they have a combination of speed, they have a combination of size, their brain operates at a different level, and they are willing to commit the time. You ask a kid, okay, mm -hmm. I want to make the league. You and I have seen so many of these kids. Great. How many hours did you spend in a gym by yourself this week? That's how you know when a kid loves it, right? Not with your trainer, not with your coach, not with your girlfriend, not with you know someone videoing you to put a highlight up. How many hours did you spend in a gym by yourself? Derek Lively, give you an example why he will be one of the he will be the best player I'll ever coach. He's got a combination of all of them. We play this weekend. We had two tough games in DC at National Hoop Fest. We lose to DeMatha. We beat National Christian. Derek played, I think, 28 to 30 minutes a game. I mean, he's wiped out. We're off on Monday. Get the kids off, of course. My coach and I are not off. We have a film session. So I get in the gym at 7 o'clock. We're down in the locker room. And who's leaving the gym at 7 o'clock? having worked on his free throws, because one day he was, I think, two of five, and one day he was three of four. He said, yeah, I just needed to get in, and I need to shoot 100 free throws, um, because I, I didn't shoot him well this weekend. I needed to get, he needed to give his body a rest, so he didn't do a really intense workout. But, you know, and it, he might have made 100 free throws. I don't know. I just know literally there's one kid was in the gym Monday night, and that just so happens to be the kid who might be the number one pick in the draft. Right. Right. So I think there's a level of commitment that these kids have, in addition to being blessed with so many gifts, what separates them is, is that skill, is that, that, that we teach to the highest level of our kids and we teach to our best players. And that means the kids in the middle and the kids in the bottom will get left behind in our program. So like if you're a kid who I don't think can be that good or is that committed, I don't want you because it's going to be a miserable experience. We're teaching to the best player. If you can be just below him, you're going to be really freaking good. Um, yeah, so I, but I think there's that level of commitment that people just don't understand mm -hmm. what it takes. Yeah, and I've heard other coaches describe it almost as a sickness to where they have to get in the gym. Like, like you said about Derek, he missed a few free throws. That's not, that's not good enough for a player like him, right? He has to get better each day. I'll give, um, give you an example. And here's, here's an analogy. I look in the mirror today and I see a basketball coach. It defines who I am. If my team is not as good, if my players don't reach their levels, I look in the mirror and I see someone who is failing. And so I think about being a basketball coach all the time mm -hmm. until I literally stopped playing. I looked in the mirror and saw a basketball player. It did not matter whether I was playing rec league ball, men's league ball, or in the NBA. <clears throat> if Derek Lively does not look in the mirror and see basketball player until the day he retires as what defines him, then he won't be as good a player as he is. So. There's a kid, A.J. Hogart. I've never coached A.J. He plays at Michigan State. He grew up around here. His dad's a good friend and um, competed against A.J. I'm not even sure I ever coached against A.J. I kicked A.J. out of an, uh, an AAU practice one day. He's a phenomenal kid, phenomenal player. That kid might make the NBA despite being a little bit undersized and a little bit underathletic because he looks in the mirror and sees basketball player, and there's nothing that's going to stop him from being the best player he can be. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, thanks for sharing that about what it takes. I think that's such a valuable lesson for kids to hear because they just, they have no idea, right? right? A lot of them have no idea. Hey, this is a fun segment we do on the show, Seth, where we talk about famous alumni from your school. And West Town, you know, great basketball, great academics, beautiful campus. But I'm going to ask you some famous alumni, and it's not a test, but I just want to see if you mm -hmm. know them and why they're famous, all right? Okay. Not <clears throat> Samuel Leeds Allen. Nope. He invented the flexible flyer, which is the world's first steerable runner snow sled. 
So you know the wooden one that you can kind of steer in the front? Bro, I am old enough to remember the flexible flyer. <laughs> you don't have to remember it, Seth. I still use it in my Do yard. Really? Yes. I fit on it, put my daughter in front of me, you can steer with your feet. That Let's guy went go. to West Town. I remember using it in New York City Hills back in the day in Central Park. That's awesome. So they're still around. And they, they really have not been technologically advanced because they're they're solid. <laughs> okay. Great. Next one, Richard T. James. Nope. He and his wife invented the Slinky. Oh, I did know the Slinky came out of West Ham. I didn't okay. know the name, but I did know that. Yes. Okay. Last one, Holland Taylor. Nope. She's an actress. She won an Emmy. Um, I don't know what's what show exactly, but she was on uh, Two and a Half Men pretty regularly. She's been the Truman Show, Legally Blonde, and a bunch of other stuff. So if you saw her picture, you'd recognize her. Oh, for sure. And then all the NBA guys. So anyway, that was that was this week's episode of Famous <laughs> Alumni from your prep school. So now you know maybe a few facts you didn't know before. Awesome. <laughs> um, aside from basketball, you started the And One Shoe and Apparel brand, which I remember the first time I met you, I, lo I looked you up and I was like, wait a second, Seth did, you know, started a brand? That at one point I read was number two uh, shoe brand in the U.S. I think back in 2001 behind Nike. So um, you could write a book on that. But just give me the basics uh, to people out there uh, listening. Like, how do you start? Like, what one, where did the idea come from? Like, where were you sitting? What were you doing when you said, I think I can do this? And two, um, let's start with that. What, where where uh, were you in that idea? Yes, in your I life? was, uh, I'd worked in, I went to Penn undergrad. I was in the college. I, I went I was legislative director for U.S. Representative Harold Ford Sr. Right. for a couple of years, you remember. Um, and then I went back to Wharton when I was young. I was 23 when I went back to Wharton um, in 91. Um, I had I, I transparently realized on the first day of grad school that I could spend a whole bunch of time working really hard and not good grades, not get good grades, or I could spend very little time not work very hard and also not get good grades. So I spent the bulk of my time in grad school playing basketball, playing trumpet and the jazz ensemble and, and clubbing. Um, I did interview for investment banking jobs and all the while I had taken a, an entrepreneurial class at Wharton. And I got into the final round uh, for an investment banking gig in public finance with Goldman Sachs and Smith Barney I was in the middle of these interviews while I had developed this business plan for the and one database marketing business. This is in 93 before the internet. The yeah. idea was we were going to accumulate the names of millions of consumers who play basketball, uh, local rec league lists, you name it, and then sell those lists to Nike, Adidas, Foot Locker. Uh, and I basically walked on the final round interviews with the investment banks and decided I was going to start my own business despite, you know, having student loans and um, being broke. It was like, this is seemed like it would be a way more fun way to spend the next few years. Like I said, two things I want to do in my life, have fun and make a difference. Um, money has never been really something that's motivated me in terms of how I want to spend my time. So I thought oh, I could go to Wall Street and be miserable or I could start my own business in basketball something that I love and think about basketball every single day. And so that's what I did. Um, and of course, it was the only good grade I got in grad school. Within six weeks after graduating, I realized the idea was horrible and I was going to fail. Um, and, but I was at a trade show and I saw like four or five different, at the time, budding basketball t-shirt brands. And I looked at their product, my partners and I were like, oh, we think we understand the basketball consumer better than they do. And we think we can, you know, create t-shirts and shorts and product that will represent basketball players better than what Nike and Adidas and Reebok are doing at the time. Um, and we thought we could speak, create a brand that would speak for and to basketball players. Uh, and so with that, we did, we chucked the, you know, the business plan for the first business, started business plan for the second business. And six weeks later, I was back at a retail on 125th Street in New York selling T-shirts. We got some a logo done, some slogans done, some shorts made. And I was literally, you know, that guy with my best friend and partner's, you know, travel bag. You want to buy some T-shirts out of the back of my Honda Civic hatchback. We're traveling up and down the East Coast to see retailers all over the place. Um, it was great. And then uh, ran and won for 12 years. Uh, it was an amazing experience. 
we we had a great team we had really good strategy and then and the one thing that i think is required for success and in any endeavors we got incredibly lucky multiple times when balls just bounced our way and, and we found ourselves with a business much bigger than we had ever planned 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 to build wow and just see a fun little fact on and one one of my prep school teammates got the and one logo tattooed on his uh, thigh how old was he what year was this this would have been 1996 mm -hmm. does that sound right <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was on his thigh well, yeah and he wasn't yeah, a very good player either so um, rob kennedy who you know runs hoop yeah. group um I, I remember it was probably somewhere in 95 96 he sent me a, a, a Polaroid back then, right? <laughs> um, a Polaroid of a kid named David Capers, who was on St. Bonaventure's team. And David had a, a tattooed our logo on his arm with his initials underneath it. <clears throat> he said, your brand is starting to be meaningful when people are tattooing themselves with it. And then we had a wall, you know, one of those old um, cork boards yep. where, where people would be sending in photos of themselves tattooing their logo. Quentin Richardson, who played in the league, had an N1 tattoo. So yeah, it was pretty awesome that we felt like people were understanding that we were trying to rep ball players. It was cool. I mean, that's got to be a good feel. Like I, every now and then, a, some kid will wear a prep athletic shirt. I sent him, and that's kind of neat. But like, no one's getting a prep athletics tattoo. Like, Word. what went through your <laughs> mind? Where you're like, hey, I don't, I don't know, guys. Like, we love our brand a lot. We live it and sell it, but that's a bit much. Well, no, like, I, I, love, I was like, this okay. is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, like, like I said. I, until I stopped playing, I looked in the mirror and saw a basketball player. So that means yeah. if you tattoo our logo, that means you see yourself as a basketball player if you were in one. It was great. It was awesome. All right. What, what's one of the being uh, with that for 12 years? Like, what's one of the coolest experiences that and one uh, that came out of and one? Like, did you have a meeting with someone or was it in a movie or what's an example of something that just you kind of got starstruck and like, wow, I never thought this was going to happen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were so many, but I'll tell you. Um, so when we, uh, in 95, we were only in apparel, we weren't in shoes yet. And we needed to find an endorser who, who we could sign and they wouldn't be violating their contract. So the Nike and Adidas Reebok contracts, you were not allowed to have an apparel deal because they were shoes and apparel. Sure. Converse allowed their players to do separate apparel deals because at the time, Converse wasn't doing apparel. They were just doing shoes. So we reached out to Larry Johnson's agent, um, George Bass, and they're based down in Houston, I think. Might've been Dallas. I think it was Dallas, then Dallas. <clears throat> and um, so sure, he reached back out. He said, we're interested. Like, love what you guys are doing. We'd love, love to meet. Why don't you fly down to, to, and so we said, sure. So five of us fly, flew down and we were wearing t-shirts and shorts. It's who we were. He said, we'll pick you up from the airport, bring you to our office. And uh, so we get, we're at the time I was 26, I think, maybe 27. I don't know. We were 27, 27, 25, a bunch of kids. We get out of the airport and, the, and, and this is, I think the first time it's ever happened for me is there's a, you know, a limo driver there with your name, Bert. And so like, oh, wow, they picked us up. Cool. We got a driver. Bro, we got into a big ass white limo. And I was like, this thing is sick. So, so we're, we're, we're riding to the office to meet LJ in this big ass white limo. We get down there, George Bass office, he's an agent, he's got a nice office. And Larry Johnson comes in and we spend, I don't know, hour, two hours hanging out with Larry Johnson. Now I had worked on Capitol Hill. I had flown with Jesse Jackson, right? And and work with and met congressman and you know been in a room with senator gore um it didn't touch <laughs> it did not touch hanging with larry johnson grandma Ma, grandma right? Ma, that yeah. was amazing so that was the first of many um experiences and and what you know what was really cool as we found found out about larry johnson was he's a great guy you know like he was just another person right um, but, but a great guy. And so that was really amazing. That was crazy. Like, I remember we were like, we we're like, yo, we're getting in that car, right? <laughs> and the car, you know, however much it costs, it, it costs more than we probably had in the bank at the time. 
<laughs> <laughs> and then you guys ended up doing the and one mixtape tour yeah which took off and went viral before things went viral as well did that, that happen by accident idea. or is that a marketing plan or no that wasn't our idea and actually here's a really interesting analogy to coaching our first two games uh first three games of the year we went three and oh my one of my assistants he said hey we have a kid in our team named Safan triplet Safan's a six foot junior guard elite athlete and elite off offensive rebounder and he said hey why don't we um change our defensive transition rules for Safan. Anytime the shot goes up, let's just tell him to go get it, go get an offensive rebound. And he has no defensive transition responsibility other than the back tip. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. Like usually we're very structured, you know, the, the wings are back, you know, if you're in the paint, you can go offensive rebound and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's an interesting idea. So I think we won our second and third game in our opening tournament because Safan had two or three putbacks in each game. And my point there is the idea did not come from me. I wasn't like beholden to what I thought, you know, like this is the right way to do it. Cause I said, so my assistant had a great idea, you know, also named Corey, Corey Jacobson. And I was like, uh, great. That sounds, you know, let's think about it. Yeah, let's do that. Awesome. The idea for the mixtape tour didn't come from within our company. It came from a 25 year old kid who was working at our ad agency, outsourced company. We had um, taped, uh, the Rucker tournament. We had sponsored the Rucker tournament. And uh, in that one game, there was Ray Ferrosson, Ali Mo, um, Kareem Reed, uh, which is known as the best cast secret. Um, I mean, just Conrad McCray, a bunch of great basketball players, some of whom went on to play professionally. And he said, you should take this tape and, and a bunch of this basketball and put it to music and, and give the tapes away. And we were like, well, I'm like, I'm from New York. I'm like, what's so unique about this is basketball. I said, no, people outside New York and outside some of the cities will have not seen this type of basketball and you should spread this love. So we did. And we, we literally gave away 50,000 tapes in a foot action promotion. We, with the tapes landed on a Friday and all you had to do was try on a pair of Amlin shoes and you got a free tape. And by Monday, the tapes were all gone nationwide. It was the single fastest promotion foot action ever had. And then an event operator came to us and said, I think we can make this into a tour. A TV production company came to us and said, I think we can make this into a TV show. The coolest thing about it though, was that like, um, there were somewhere between 15 and 20 guys who had a, a, a different type of professional basketball opportunity than they would not have had if, if M1 Mixtape hadn't existed, the tour hadn't existed. So we enabled, guys to have a different kind of career than they otherwise would have had. So that was really cool. Um, you know, the events were really cool. Fans loved the events. We kept the prices reasonable. So lots of people could come to our games. It was really cool. I, I was in Santa Monica when we were having an event. The game started at four. I'm not a morning guy. So I told my head of PR, I'd call her when I woke up. So I wake up at like, 11 and i'm like hey I'll, I'll be down you know there around one or two and she's like no you probably need to get here by noon and this is an out outdoor game in santa monica courts um and uh i was like why she's like well the fire marshal let us know that we're about to be shut down for new people coming in into the court in, in the area because we're over we're going to be over coat i'm like well the game's not five hours. She was like, yep, you better get here the next hour or I can't get you in. Wow. <laughs> I was like, wow. It's a good crazy. problem to have right there. Yeah, it's crazy. Did the, did the mixtape translate to more sales for and one? You know, what's interesting, Corey, is I'm not sure that it helped our brand because in fact, um, when we launched a mixtape tour and TV show, our sales actually dip so they were on the way up then they dipped then they kind of came back i don't know you could argue like we had you probably don't know this we had 103 nba ball players oh, I didn't wearing know. one shoes when we sold the company in 2005 we had 23 percent of the league wearing our shoes hmm. and, or maybe 33 percent and no one knew it because everyone knew the mixtape tour so we had quickly gone from what we thought of ourselves as an nba performance brand to much more of a, you know, a street ball entertainment brand. 
And I'm not sure that we didn't lose some consumers gotcha. uh, in that process, but I'm not sure it would have mattered. Like we wouldn't have been able to stop that train nor would we have wanted to. Gotcha. With uh, your success at that, if someone younger or even middle-aged wants to start their own company, you know, what advice would you give them? Being that you have mentioned earlier that you've had a few ventures that have taken off and a few that haven't made it. And now that you're, you know, you've done this for a while, give me a couple big points. And I'm an entrepreneur as well in this, like prep athletics, yeah. it's, it's doing its own thing now. So I'm, I'm as interested as anyone else, but what advice can you give uh, folks doing the entrepreneurial game? Yeah. I had a, had a friend who's actually a younger VC. He and I were texting last night and he, he's, he's backed by a couple of billionaires. And he said, um, you know, I got to figure out, I got to figure out how to, how to get rich. And I said, no, bro. Uh, yeah. He said, you got to figure out how to maximize your time. The money is an outcome. And he texted back, oh, that's some straight Kobe shit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, like I, I, if, you, if to me, being an, being an entrepreneur and deciding to be an entrepreneur is first and foremost a decision for about how you want to spend your time, right? Every day we wake up and we get to choose how we want to spend our day and how we want to spend the 16 odd waking hours we have. Um, if money is what is the deciding factor for you instead of time, I would actually argue there are many better opportunities than being an entrepreneur. If you're talented and you want to go be corporate, um, over time, you will be financially independent. You know, it might take you a little bit longer, but if what you want is money, entre the entrepreneurial life is actually not, it, in my opinion. If what you want to do is love every minute that you have and, and spend your time doing what you love, being an entrepreneur is the best life. Uh, it's terrifying. You know, when I first started, I'm sure, Corey, you know, like, I remember when I started, I, I started the day I graduated from grad school, I walked out to my desk in my apartment, and I saw a blank piece of paper. And I was like, oh, wow. What do I do? What do I do? Right? You know, like, from the time we grow up, someone tells us what to do, where to be, what time to wake up, what time school starts, what to wear, how many sick days you got to work, what's your quarterly budget. And as an entrepreneur, no one's telling you anything. You got that own blank piece of paper and you got to write it. Um, so it's terrifying, but that freedom to me is, is awesome. So I really value that, that freedom to, to spend every day doing what I want to do. And, um, and, and so I, I was at grad school at Warden last week and I, there were five things that were required for me to be successful. One was love. I had to love what I did. Two is I had to have a great team. Third is I'd have a good strategy. Four is, four is we had to really focus on the details, success in the details. And lastly, is I had to really get lucky. For me, love, it, it starts with love. If I don't love what I'm doing, I'm just wasting time. Mm -hmm. I think some people can be more mercenary than that and they can like what they're doing, but there's gotta be that L in front, in my opinion, if you wanna be an entrepreneur. Yeah, love that. And you know, it's pretty cliche, but you hear people say it all the time, like five, find your passion, follow it, everything will take care of itself. And um, with this prep athletics, you know, I, I did it for eight years, just begging kids to help them for prep schools because of what it did for me and what it did for my cousin, you know, who played in the NBA. And I, I didn't even go into this trying to be an entrepreneur and starting a business. So sometimes this stuff happens accidentally. And I don't know if I had a blank page in front of me, if I would have ever gone down this route. So you're right. I think the luck thing is very important as well you know, what is it? 10% of the businesses make it. That's, that's a VC number, right? Like you, you invest in 10 companies hoping one makes it. That's kind of the math, right? My math is different. We, we, that is, that is correct. That's that like is, industry yeah, standard. That is, right? that is correct. That is industry standard VC. Um, we really want to have a 50% hit rate. We choose okay. many fewer deals and, and not surprising. I overinvest my time in, in my entrepreneurs. Like we really see ourselves as coaches and, and, and members of their team as opposed to check writers but standard vc is 10. you know i think uh, i think if you go to the top grad schools and top undergrad schools i think those kids actually have a 50 percent hit rate okay I think half of them are gonna make it one thing i want to talk to you now uh near finishing up is that covid and college placement right so you being a prep school when kids come to west town obviously they got to be good they got to have the skills you want they got to have the academics they got to want to get better and all that and you take those kids on but ultimately they're also expecting like hey if i'm going to a place like west town i need coach Berger to help place me so since covid's happened obviously derek lively 
that's that's just him picking uh you know which blue blood program he wants to join but for the rest of the guys in your team how has placement gone for you and has COVID changed kind of what kind of player you might take now versus when you might have taken pre-COVID yeah um it the the second part COVID hasn't actually take changed who I would take um because I never want a kid who comes to West Ham who wants to move up I want a kid who comes to West Ham who wants to get ready and that whatever that level is the uh, the coaches will figure that out the, the player has to become the best player he can be whether that's a really good D3 kid or a D1 kid or a pro, right? I think the level, I want kids who want to get ready as opposed to who want to get exposure because if you get exposure, sometimes you just get exposed. COVID has significantly changed the process and the, the expectation level. So today, if a coach is taking a kid in September through December, and I see it, I have two unsigned seniors today. They are going to take a kid that is one or two levels better than their league. They can wait on a kid that is at their level because they can get them in a transfer portal. They can get them in March. And, and I think there's somewhere around 20, 25% as many scholarships available today for early kids. It'll change late, like what'll happen as you know, in September, every college coach loves their team. By mid-November, there's about, you know, third of their team they're not so enthralled with. And then by March, they might be like, man, I hope half these kids would leave. Well, today, half these kids can leave because they can go transfer and play some rust. So I think the timing is going to get moved back significantly. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, let's say there are 100 scholarships. Or let, let's say in a, in, a, in a year, there are 1,000 scholarships. Just use a round number, Okay. I think this year there will be 250 that will be signed in November and 750 that will be signed in March, April, May. Um, if those thousand get signed, the other thing will be interesting is, and, and I'm curious for your opinion on this, how long is this cycle going to take to wash out because the COVID kids got an extra year and the one-time free transfer rule, the NCAA basically put two for two double whammies for existing high school kids. Mm -hmm. so I see, like we're, we play against a lot of prep schools, kids that have already graduated from high school. Those kids today, a lot of them are actually double preps. Like we're playing against a lot of the same kids who have now prepped twice because they didn't have the division one opportunities they thought they were gonna have. So um, I think what, what it means for me is uh, we have to work harder, right? And, and by the way, players have to get better soon. So one of the two unsigned players is, is my youngest son um, who has had some fantastic games and some not so fantastic games. We were down in DC on Saturday. He was great. He put up 18 points against the math. His decision-making was excellent. Wasn't great on Sunday. He had 14 points, nine rebounds, four assists, but also had six turnovers. Anyone that saw him on Sunday who had come to see him on Saturday is not coming back. So the kid's window has has also gotten tighter so that that that's what i think now i'm curious what you think i really think it's interesting college coaches have to decide in my opinion i'm going to be a transfer coach yep or i'm going to be a build coach what you can't do and i don't do this at west town by the way like i won't recruit over my kids if you came here as a freshman or sophomore and you did what you're supposed to do and there's someone who's a little bit better than you i'm not taking him and screwing you just not Right. If someone comes who is, let's say you're a mid-major and there's a pro, I go to my team and I'm like, look, do we want this kid? He's going to help us all get better by practicing against him every day, playing with him every day. But everyone's 28 minutes just became 24. Do we want this kid? I'll, mm -hmm. I'll include my kids in that decision making process. They almost inevitably say, yeah, because he's going to make us better. And I'll, I'll do six starters. So kids, you know, like if a kid's not willing to give up starting one of one sixth of our games and, and then I don't want him in our program, you know, and, I, and I've, I've lost like high, high majors and pros. <clears throat> I want to start every game. Why do I start? So from the transfer COVID thing, I think what's happened is um, it, this year specifically is going to be very tough for 22s. Next year will be the same. 
And then I think when we get back to 24, there'll be some programs. They're not going to recruit high school kids. And there'll be some programs that are not really going to recruit transfers. And it'll, those, they'll start to figure that out. But for today, man, these 22 kids got an uphill battle. What do you think? I'm really curious. I mean, you see more than me. Well, I agree with you on, I think a lot of programs now are trying transfers out for the first time just because of the pressure to win right away. And I think some coaches that have never done it before are going to try it and realize they'd rather have younger kids and develop them. Now, the problem is finding that kid that's not going to transfer, right? right. And I think, I, I don't know if you were on this round table this summer or not talking about which college programs had no transfers. And I think Yale, that coach has been there. I think James has never had a transfer. Never had a transfer. Which right. to me, if I'm him, I am blasting that in neon lights to every recruit I talk to because that says a lot, right? Um, and there's other programs like, you know, Kentucky, my hometown. I, I love the Cats, but every year I don't know who the heck's on the team. I don't know who the All-Americans are. And by the time I get to know them in March, they're all gone after the tournament. And to me, I just don't get as excited about that anymore. So I do think coaches are, one, going to have to talk to their ADs and say, look, we can have a winning program here. You have to give me time. I need five years. I can build it from the ground up, just like you mentioned, right? But if they're under these three-year contracts where they got to win, get to the postseason, or or they're out of a job and they're out of you know providing for their family, they're going to do whatever means possible. You'll look at some rosters now, it's all JUCO guys. You look at some rosters, half of it's international. You look at other rosters, half of it's transfer, sometimes more. And yeah, the high scores are getting screwed, but that's where I have a couple things to say on that. One, for some kids, you got a post-grad option, right? Buy time. Let this thing settle down a little bit more so we can learn even more information after one more year. But I, this, is a, this is a mercenary thing to say, Seth, but get better, right? Yep. The kids that aren't playing college ball right now probably shouldn't be playing college ball. You know, I think there's 500 kids now that, that didn't get you to go D1 last year because 500 seniors stuck around. Well, you probably weren't good enough to play D1 anyway. If you were, right. you would have found a roster, which in turn makes D2 better, which in turn makes D3 better. And the guy's not playing in college. It's not for everybody. It's a privilege, not a right. So to me, it's Darwinism, right? The best rise to the top. It's survival of the fittest. And it's not fair. I get that. But life's not fair. This is your first life lesson in that. And that's a brutal thing to say to kids trying to reach their dream. But hey, man, like you've had 18 years to work on your resume on the court and off the court, right? Here's another thing I like to say too, Seth, is tell me if you, if you find this as well, but everyone's so enamored, infatuated with how many points per game they score or slowing down a highlight in their, in their highlight video. When college coaches are looking at the nine other things that you do besides scoring, taking charges, being a good teammate, being coachable, hustling, rebounding, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me about that. Do your kids realize that it's more than scoring and are the college coaches you're talking to saying that as well um it's it of course uh two two i think it's really just got two responses um first is i have never i've been doing this 15 years as a head coach had a coach ask me how many points does a player average never and every kid that comes to west town i'm like how many coaches do you think have asked and they pretty quickly understand because they're smarter, they wouldn't be a West Ham. I'm asking the question because the answer is zero. Zero. Now, having said that, uh, just like you talked about Darwinism, college coaches who are assistant coaches, when they come to the events, games, and they spend their time on their phone, they spend their time talking, and they're not watching all the other things that you, that you just talked about, they might end up getting fired because their job is to bring in the right players for their head coach and to identify the right players. I, I still think today um, so many guys are looking at uh, the things that find their way into social media and are not necessarily looking at things that are going to be uh, helping programs win. Coach Jones at Yale does. Like, like someday – like I, they had recruited TJ, my son, who ended up at, he's now at San Diego. You know, I, I thought it'd be an amazing opportunity for any kid to go play for him. They, they talk about defend, rebound, share the ball. I still remember those are the three pillars of their program. Defend, rebound, and share the ball. When the Yale basketball staff goes to watch players, everyone can tell you who can fill it up. That's really easy, right? Who watches defending rebounds, sharing the ball to know if it's going to fit with their program? 
Um, and so every year as they're recruiting my kids, I can tell by what the assist assistants are asking about. What does that program value? That helps me in terms of knowing which programs my kids should go to. Mm -hmm. Jalen Worley is a great example. Jalen's at Florida State today, right? Jalen is a really, really, really talented offensive player. But he is not fast enough and doesn't shoot it well enough to make the league as a 6'6 point guard unless he becomes a much better defender. Well, when Florida State recruited him, and, and I tried to hold him accountable, but I looked down and he looked down. He's like, well, if you take me out, who are you putting in? <laughs> right? So there are times I'd pull him out. And he knew why he was coming out right away. But we couldn't get him to a level 10 commitment on defense. He's at Florida State. I watch him play defense right now. I'm like, oh, like it's not at a 10 yet. But he sure has gone from a 6 to an 8 really fast. So to him, in terms of him knowing what I need to do to make the league, I'm not a lock one and done. It's not because I'm going to get 30 a game. I need to be aligned with what that staff's about. Mm -hmm. I think you're totally right. I think some guys build their programs and look at the things that are important to their programs. And, you know, Coach Jones, great example. Like when he took over Yale, Yale was at the bottom of the IB program. I think he's been there 19 or 20 years now. He's never had a transfer. He's been at the top of the IB now for maybe 10 years. Didn't get there overnight. Took him a while. Look at Coach Hamilton, you know, top programs in the country last 10 years they sent guys to the league over and over and over and and they're recruiting things other than who can just fill it up yeah and that's one thing i don't know what your what your numbers are on your guys but i tell prep school coaches look if you send guys to schools and they don't transfer market that to families that means you are placing them in the right fitting situations that's right we've had let me think about that it's funny my son was I, at the time I've been coaching 13 years. He was the first kid ever to decommit. <laughs> it didn't want to, it didn't end up, I want to be an Ivy kid. And he transferred after never like changing teams ever. Um, and, and Georgetown was great. They told him, Hey, listen, if you want to have an opportunity to play earlier, you should go because of the transfer that they just brought in. Um, who else has transferred Jake Forrester? Um, you know, he transferred from Indiana to temple and the point is that's some math you can do and you can say, Hey, West town, this percentage of kids that's gone to college has, has, has stayed there. I think yeah. that's marketable now. And parents would really, I mean, I know you're picking kids on your certain parameters, but I think part of your pitch could absolutely include that. And I think other, other prep school coaches do that as well right now. I think you're right. You know, the other thing is that it, it's been 15 years and, and I've had one kid that I coached who didn't graduate from college. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Uh, if they didn't make the go to the league or um, yeah. I, need to think about the treatment. I don't think we've had other kids. I, I'm sure I'm missing a kid who transferred over, but I, Oh, Jair Bolden. Sorry. Ja, I just saw Ja. He transferred three days. He's, he's now spent six years in college. He's gotten three degrees. He's playing for Baltimore. He's, he's going to turn 25 in March. I just saw him out in Vegas for uh Maui, Maui, Jim Maui. Yeah. Ja, ja went from GW to South Carolina and now two years of Butler. Okay. That's it. I, yeah. 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 But well, use that if you want to. I know you're a math guy. Yeah, so you can yeah. figure out that percentage. Yeah. All right, we're going to end up on some quick hitters here to end, Seth. Um, biggest win of your career as a coach? Friend Central. Um, it was 2012. Uh, the rumor was that we hadn't been Friend Central in 35 years. I don't know if that's true. Friend Central had uh, just beaten us down for uh, my first five years as a head coach. They beat everybody. They had a kid named Emil Jefferson, who's now a coach at Duke, who was going to Duke. Mm -hmm. uh, they started five D1 kids. We started two D1 bigs and three D1 guards. Uh, sorry, three D3 guards. Um, and we beat them 54-52 in triple overtime in our gym with Coach K coming to watch Emil Jefferson. Um, it was, and, and that basically, that year <coughs> our league for the first time since 1986. Um, the second biggest win would have been beating A and C in the French Friends League Championship about a month later to to win our league for the first time. Um, those were the that was the, the biggest win. Um, we've beaten some great teams. We've beaten some great teams on national TV, but in terms of program changing wins, we actually got over the the hump and beat Friends Central. And and we almost lost the game. We were up seven with about a minute and a half the game, and I almost completely torched the game. 
um, and we had to go to overtime and then overtime and then overtime. <laughs> and my wife made a cake the next day, 54, 52, triple OT, the whole team ate it. It was awesome. Real quick, uh, they asked Coach K once what the biggest win of his career was, and he said, yeah, you'd think it'd be the national titles, but it was when I was at Army and we won the seventh place game in some tournament. It was like, they're, <laughs> you know, instead of being eighth place, they were in seventh place. And to him, that's the most memorable tournament because that was his first – you know, like big win of his career and it's always stuck with him. So I always thought that was a fun yeah. piece of trivia. Who's the best player you've ever coached against? Against? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Deion Waiters. Uh, Deion Waiters in high school, we were winning. He showed up to the gym when warm-ups were ending. Um, we were playing Life Center, who was very, very good. Dion. Uh, put on his shoes as the t teams were being announced. We were winning 17 to six. Um, one of our kids who went to play at Bryant was started talking a lot of shit to Dion. I was like, oh no. And then it was 32, 27. Um, and we basically, our offense was, went from do what we want to, let's try to keep the ball away from Dion because he's going to steal it and dunk it on the other end. And by damn, if he didn't, and like, I don't, we ended up losing about like 15, but for like eight minutes, Dion was like, okay, I've had enough of this right now. This is my court. And I was like, oh my God, there's literally nothing we can do. I think at one point we were in a triangle and two with two guys on Dion. It didn't matter. <laughs> he was, yeah, it was like, it was, and I've coached against a lot of great players. The best player I've seen in high school since I've been coaching was Jason Tate. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, but the best player I've coached against was, uh, was, De was Deion Waiters. That was, like, <laughs> no, I just felt helpless. I was like, there's nothing I could do right here. Yeah. Like, I could try to pay the rest 300 bucks a man to try to file them out. That's the only shot we got. <laughs> How about when you're not coaching, Seth? What are your hobbies? Uh, golf. I, got, I, I, um, I played poker like semi-professionally um, for a while. And uh, then this past during COVID, two things happened. I stopped driving to work and realized my hip problems were not from golf, it was from driving. Oh. So it was really cool. I got to play golf again. So I've really gotten into golf. My oldest son played golf in college. And um, so I got to know what a good golfer looks like and, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to get there. So for me, my life is basically coach basketball, be a venture capitalist and, uh, and, then, and then and golf when my wife uh, allows me to. Okay, last question. What's your favorite movie of all time? Oh, um, Love Actually. We watch it. My wife and I watch it together Christmas Eve um, every year. It's my favorite, my favorite movie of all time. It's awesome. Bring, I, it still brings me to tears um, on Christmas Eve night. Yeah, good one. Well, Seth, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Learned a lot today. Um, and, uh, you know, you're a good friend. I, I'm happy for your success. And my gosh, you're one of the most interesting men out there in the basketball world with your background and everything you do, and, and you're doing it the right way. So um, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Corey. Life pleasure. Back at you. Hey, we'd like to thank uh, Coach Seth Berger of Westtown School for joining us today. If you like what you hear, be sure to share this with someone. A lot of good information on here for players, families, other coaches. And be sure to subscribe on YouTube, all the major podcasting platforms. and. Uh, we're around the holidays right now, so I don't talk to you in a couple of weeks. Have a happy holidays and a happy new year. And thanks so much for tuning in. Good night, brother. Thank you.